Thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. I'm Brian Bird. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Michigan. And I've been uh, asked to introduce Casey, uh, which is a great pleasure. I I'm really excited to introduce Casey Green as today's speaker in the seminar series. Dr. Green uh, received his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry degree from Berry College in Georgia. He then received his PhD in computational genetics from Dartmouth College. Uh, he moved to the Lewis Sigler Institute for Integrative Genomics at Princeton University, where he was a postdoctoral fellow. And he ended up starting his independent laboratory at Dartmouth College's uh, Geisel School of Medicine's Department of Genetics before moving to the University of Pennsylvania, where he was ultimately granted tenure. He very recently relocated to the University of Colorado School of Medicine, which is in Denver, uh, where he is the director of a new center for health AI, and he is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics. In addition, he's the director of the Childhood Cancer Data Lab for Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. He's received many awards, distinctions, and grants. Uh, early in his career, he was the winner of the Graphic Processing Unit for Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Competition in 2009. In 2014, he was one of 14 more investigators in data-driven discovery from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. He's also been funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and he has an NIH R01 award, uh, perhaps many other uh, funding sources that I am not aware of that essentially people would like to give their money to Casey to work on interesting projects. Uh, he's extensively published. Uh, I want to highlight his tendency to publish ideas that really move the needle with a focus on analyzing publicly available data in exceptionally clever ways. I'll give you just a few examples of which I'm aware. Uh, he's used transfer learning to enhance the analysis of rare diseases. He's shown that uh, generative adversarial neural networks can be paired with differential privacy concepts to facilitate the sharing of clinical research study data while preserving study participants' privacy. He's worked on the topic of biases in speaker selection at scientific conferences. He's invented a system for writing manuscripts collaboratively called Manubot. He founded the Tongue-in-Cheek Research Parasite Awards, which recognize people who've made an important contribution, uh, con contribution analyzing data that were generated by someone else. And I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Green in a variety of contexts on different projects. It's always interesting. It's always inspiring. I always learn something new and I always look at things differently after I've worked with him. He's in high demand as a speaker around the world and we're very lucky to have him today. So without further ado, ado uh, Casey, please, let's, let's hear what you've got to say today. Thank you. That was a very generous introduction. Um, hopefully I can live up to some of that. Uh, yeah, so I, I did just move to um, the University of Colorado. Uh, I've been, we've, we've lived here now about two months, uh, and uh, I can say wonderful things about the Anschutz Medical Campus here. Um, you know, actually, this is an interesting seminar because I was originally supposed to give it, I think, last April. Uh, and in, in many ways, uh, the world has changed dramatically since last April. Um, and in some ways, uh, I haven't actually traveled anywhere else except other than you know, moving here. So um, it's really been kind of a, a certainly a remarkable year. Um, you know, I, I'm just really excited to be here. I, I love Ann Arbor. I wish I was <laughs> physically there. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's a wonderful town. Um, and the university is, um, you know, absolutely phenomenal. I've had the opportunity to um, share our research a couple times. And so I, I wanted to make sure um, that the work that I presented was something hopefully folks hadn't seen before. So um, I, I've tried to refresh uh, to make sure that this is only stuff from the last year. I know um, with Brian, we previously worked on using generative adversarial neural networks to simulate synthetic data. And I ended up pruning that from this talk. So uh, I, I should have kept my Michigan collaboration in, but <laughs> sorry, Brian. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really excited about the opportunity for machine learning to open up uh, really new avenues of research. Um, and, you know, for those of you who work in machine learning or think about it, you know, I think the key challenge is always data. Um, you know, one of the nice things about working in biomedicine is, and science in general, is that this expectation that your work be reproducible means that you pretty much have to generate data artifacts uh, for that to be true. 
And so, you know, there's a real nice opportunity to, to really synthesize these in subsequent work. Um, so, uh, you know, I, we work a lot on gene expression. So the, the, I ended up trying to sort of figure out where to go with this talk. And so I ended up deciding to focus on gene expression. Um, and in that space, if you just look at what's downloadable on the internet, you get about a 4 million genome-wide gene expression profile. So basically imagine these as little snapshots of what happens in a tissue um, 4 million times. Uh, if you think about what these costs to generate in the first case, I'd estimate it's about $4 billion. Uh, I haven't yet gotten a $4 billion grant, maybe one day, uh, but I do have an internet connection. So if I'm like Lego Grace Hopper here, uh, you know, I can actually go download this. And if you're like Lego Grace Hopper and you have an internet connection, you can also go download this and use it. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity um, that, you know, sometimes has been overlooked in these data. Uh, so the first story I'm going to tell is one that focuses on sort of a key gap that uh, this is probably the most technical story <laughs> um, that, that I'll share that's kind of a deep dive into the OMIC data. But, you know, one of the challenges we have is when we want to look across data sets, um, it can be really hard to do that, particularly if the data sets are generated on different with different tissues, but measuring the same common process or the same disease. Uh, and so, you know, what we really wanted to do in this project, we always kind of start with a wouldn't it be great if. So it was like, you know, wouldn't it be great if, uh, you know, we have this gap, we can sort of find modules and in individual data sets, and then we have to compare them to see if they're sort of equivalent. Um, and that actually requires a lot of thought and a lot of human time. And so uh, Dr. Jacqueline Taroni was the postdoc in the group who did this. And, and when she started, we had this really nice kind of wouldn't it be great if conversation. It's like, what if you could just pull modules off the shelf and those modules could apply to all of the data sets that you cared about? And then you could take those modules. And then when you look, you don't have to sort of manually say this module in this data set is the same as this module in this data set. You could really just look directly across them and say, is this module perturbed in this condition? Like, that would make our lives so much easier. And so, um, you know, Jackie, of course, reframed this in a way that's actually a solvable problem um, and said, you know, can we learn reusable modules across data sets? And her hypothesis was, um, you know, it's both obvious, but I also thought fundamentally, it's obvious in retrospect, which is one of those wonderful things, but it was kind of fundamentally profound to me at the time, uh, which is that these biologically meaningful patterns, including sort of cell type information, disease information, pathway regulation, could be learned from heterogeneous gene expression data. And if you learn them there, then you could transfer them to the data sets of interest without having to use your really valuable sample size on the data sets that you really care about to try to learn about what's happening with transcriptional modules. So if you imagine this world where you have a whole bunch of samples and then a whole bunch of genes, you could take those samples and, and genes and really combine them into samples by patterns. And what you'd really love is for these patterns to be things that were meaningful, biologically meaningful, that you could think about and reason over. And then if you could learn this on a whole bunch of data that was less important to you, you could take those patterns to a data set that you really cared about, perhaps a rare disease uh, data set or a set of data sets. And then you could look to see if those patterns were expressed differently. And, you know, you could do this in a couple different ways, but, um, you know, the nice thing is if you have these reusable patterns, you could apply them to multiple different data sets, the same pattern applied to multiple different data sets and really see where things fell out and which patterns were consistently regulated in the same way across data sets and as say in association with disease severity. Um, and so when we started this project, we were like, well, where, where do you actually get a whole bunch of pre-processed data? Uh, there was this really wonderful paper from Jeff Leake's group reporting on a resource called Recount2. So the first author is Colado Torres. And actually, um, in the weirdest bit of, of uh, side trivia, I believe uh, Brian can, can correct me, but uh, the, this data set was actually selected as the winner of the Research Symbiont Award two years ago. Is that right? That's correct. Two years ago. Yeah. So that was really fun. So I guess subsequent to our use, um, this was also recognized as an exemplar in data sharing, which is um, uh, Brian actually runs the award. Um, so yeah, fun, fun side bit of trivia. Um, this data set at the time that, that um, we were looking at, it consisted of 70,000 RNA-seq samples that had been uniformly processed. If you want to think about what this cost to generate, uh, you know, if we estimate $1,000 a sample, that's about a $70 million data set. This one's really nice because you can download it already pre-processed and just use it off the shelf. So we have really loved this data set. So I think that award was very well deserved. Um, so yeah, so we took our $70 million data set that we had to pay like pennies on the dollar to generate, less than pennies on the dollar to, to generate and use. Um, and we applied this method to it. So this is a method called Plier. Um, it's now been published. It just got published in Nature Methods um, uh, about a year ago. Um, it's from Wayne Mao and Maria Shakina at Pitt. Um, and it's called the Pathway Level Information Extractor. And what Plier does is it essentially takes this large matrix. So in this case, it's the recount uh, two matrix, and then it tries to factorize it. So it tries to essentially say, 
can you can you group sort of gene modules and then take those gene modules and use them to reconstruct the original data to give you your samples by pattern. So you get sort of a genes by patterns matrix and your samples by patterns matrix. Um, and Plyer, we've done this a whole bunch of different ways, actually. <laughs> um, this was originally a project using deep neural networks, but it turns out Plyer worked pretty darn well. So we ended up going that route. Um, and you know what, what this does really nicely is it has this preference for sort of things that align to pathways and it has a couple of sparsity constraints. And in our experience, you know, one way that we think about these is that you're essentially taking a whole bunch of data and you're compressing it. And that compression has essentially an arbitrary rotation. Like you could, you could change those factors. Um, you could essentially rotate that in any way. And the rotation doesn't matter for the reconstruction task, but it does matter for the sake of view of interpretability, right? We'd rather have the axes in the data set essentially aligned to known pathways. And so this plier method seems to do a pretty nice job of that. So, so we've been really happy with its performance in this context. Um, and so since everything in computational biology needs a name, uh, what we did is we said, well, we're doing multi data set flyer. And so this machine learning model for many biological contexts, we essentially take um, recount two, we apply flyer to it, and that gives us the multiplier method, multi data set flyer. Um, and we wanted to ask, like, what does this actually give us? If you really look at the model, why do you do this? Why don't you just take a whole bunch of data for a specific disease? Um, and our actual goal was to study a disease called ANCA-associated vasculitis, um, but there weren't enough samples in the public data for us to really build a credible training compendium for ANCA-associated vasculitis. So when we were characterizing the method, we tried to pick another um, autoimmune disease where we could get enough data. So we downloaded all the whole blood data that we could find for lupus. Um, and so our comparison here will be this lupus whole blood data set, which is kind of, you could imagine what you would do if you were gonna study um, an autoimmune disease where you could get enough samples to really build a training set. Um, and so this, where you see this box, these two box plots, these data sets are the same size. So this is the lupus whole blood data set, essentially all the whole blood data we could get from um, samples associated with lupus. And then we subsampled recount two to be the exact same size as that lupus data set. So this experiment, wherever you see these two box plots, is examining same size data set, different composition, generic human data downloaded from the internet, disease specific data. Um, and then the other thing I'm showing is um, when you keep the same type of data, but you allow the sample size to change. So this is all of recount two, where I show you the diamond, the machine learning model built from all of recount two. And then this is the recount two subsample. And so now that we understand what these plots will show, I can kind of show you a little bit about what the axes are. So the first thing we just wanted to ask is how many latent variables do you discover? Like how many sort of reproducible features in the data are there? Um, and Plyer has a nice way to sort of figure out if a latent variable is reproducible, which is what we used as the definition here. Um, and so uh, what you can see is you actually get fewer latent variables um, if you use generic human data versus disease specific data. This is probably a little bit reassuring. Um, you know, you do take a, what looks like a little bit of a power hit in terms of latent variable discovery um, if, you, if you just randomly select human data, but you get many, many more latent variables if you use all the data, right? Because your sample size here is many fold greater. Uh, so this sort of suggests that sample size can really help you. So you learn more total sort of late, reproducible latent variables. Um, we can ask what fraction, so because Plyer takes pathway information as input, you can ask what fraction of pathways do you actually get back? Um, we don't know what the upper bound here should be, right? Because not all pathways are gonna be co-regulated, um, but we, we can kind of say that, you know, if we get more things back that were in our input pathways, we can sort of reproducibly identify transcriptional signals associated with um, some kind of a priori biological knowledge. We might expect that we're sort of better able to capture biology. Um, here you can see there's not a big difference actually between the, the subsampled recount two and the lupus data set, but simply just being able to have more data lets you reproducibly uh, identify more sort of things that include known pathways. Um, so this we sort of say, okay, we learn kind of more known knowns. And then the fun thing is um, what you really wanna ask is, is this method giving me anything that I wouldn't find with something like GSEA, right? Gene set enrichment analysis uses curated sets of genes. So you might say, is there anything here that goes beyond what you get out of GSEA? So essentially what fraction of latent variables, um, which are the modules here, were not already associated with known pathways? I mean, when we look at that, um, only about 20% of the latent variables that came out were in some way associated with a known pathway. And so, you know, what this suggests is, um, you know, a, a fair number of these are, are like, you know, are probably biological as you sort of put this and this together, you kind of guess that, that many of them are uh, biological but you know, have not been uh, curated into the um, public databases yet. And so uh, this was pretty exciting. It suggests that you, know, you can take this model then and, and go do, do discovery and maybe find some things that weren't already curated. Um, so we kind of learn more of the known knowns, but we also learn more unknown unknowns, you know, largely a function of just having a lot of data.
Um, and so, you know, I think the takeaway is this, right? So for a broad audience, here's what I'd say. Um, machine learning analyses that reuse data from other settings can reach this level of detail that was otherwise impossible. I don't think this is specific to genomic data. If you're thinking about biological problems um, or any problem where, you know, there's a sort of uh, shared structure across problems, uh, shared structure across data sets, I think integrating those data sets can be really helpful. Um, certainly there are challenges associated. I'll use the next block of time to kind of talk about how we probe some of those. Um, but, you know, I think, I think this is a little bit empowering, right? Essentially, if you could have more data, you pretty much want more data. Um, it, it, it's kind of a nice, simple message. Um, and then, you know, I want to sort of show one use case of this. Um, so this was the idea, remember, the wouldn't it be great if right now we're stuck in this modular framework, we have to figure out if modules are the same. But it, now we have our sort of recount two trained multiplier model. We take that, we apply it to our data sets of interest, and then we can just ask if there are consistent associations across those data sets. And so we use this in a whole bunch of different ways in the paper, but this was the, this was the actual motivating example that drove the project in the first place. Um, so we have these three data sets from ANCA associated vasculitis patients um, and, and sort of healthy controls and other conditions. Um, and one was airway epithelial cells, one was renal glomeruli, um, microdissected renal glomeruli. Um, and then um, another one was uh, PBMCs. And they're from three different studies. None of the patients, to my knowledge, are the same uh, in these. Um, and what we wanted to do was to identify, is there some systematic factor that across all these tissues is different? Um, and uh, this was the, you know, one of the, the really significant strong associations that came out across all of these um, was that M0 macrophages were associated with severity. So the way these plots are arranged, this is actually latent variable the latent variable 10, um, from the, which is actually had an annotation on it for the M0 macrophages, uh, the way these plots are arranged is the least severe form of the diseases on the right, or healthy controls in this data set, the most severe form of the diseases on the left. And you can see this uh, strong severity association for this latent variable uh, in the air airway epithelial cells. Uh, you see the same thing in the renal glomeruli when you compare it to uh, nephrotic syndrome or living donor controls. And you see the same thing uh, in PBMCs um, and, you know, one of the things that I don't always mention on this, but is worth noting, um, because this is a rare disease, there's not a lot of data out there that's really easy to obtain. So these are actually all microarray data sets. Um, it, you know, it just so happens that um, that's what was largely available. So we've actually trained these latent variables on RNA-seq data, but we've applied them to microarray data. Um, so we found they're, they're reasonably nice uh, and robust in this setting. Um, subsequent to this, another group has taken these and used them to study um, neurofibromatosis and also found um, some nice portability um, to that setting. That was another RNA-seq. They, they looked across multiple RNA-seq experiments in a similar way. Um, so we hope that these will be useful in many settings for people. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we do focus on a lot is reproducibility. So we try to make sure that people can reuse what we build. Um, so there's a whole bunch associated with this paper. Uh, these are, there's about, I think there's in the end about 40 GitHub notebooks, uh, uh, sorry, 40 no uh, IPython notebooks on GitHub. Um, the for, or, or uh, R Markdown notebooks on GitHub, the, the top ones are pretty much what's in the paper. And then there's a, uh, the top ones are sort of figures in the paper. The next ones are figures in the supplement. And then the final ones are things that we thought were really interesting and fun and did analyses of, but couldn't quite fit in the paper uh, given the figure length, length constraints. Um, and so there's quite a bit um, that sort of dives into different ways that you might use these. So I would say if this is a method that you're interested in, um, I would encourage you to go to GitHub uh, and, and check out what's there because there might be a workflow that you could almost exactly follow for your own work. Um, so there's some here like looking at um, trying to predict response in clinical trials using latent variables, for instance. Um, so this uh, got published, oh wow, two years ago now. It's amazing. It doesn't feel like 2020 actually happened at all. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is now out if you're interested. And I, I think this GitHub is a really nice exemplar of um, being able to put uh, software out there so folks can use it. I thought uh, Dr. Taroni did a really wonderful job of that. So I'd encourage you to take a look if you're interested. Um, so uh, those of you who have sort of quantitative training in genomics, probably just watched that entire talk cringing, right? You were like, ooh, you really shouldn't put data sets together that way. And you really, the batch effects will just absolutely kill this, right? There's no way this could possibly work. It shouldn't work, right? That's what I learned. I learned that this type of analysis would never, never work because batch effects would completely dominate the signal. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny for the last, I guess, almost 10 years, um, we've been doing this and we've kind of observed that it works, but it's always made me cringe a little bit because it really shouldn't. Uh, and, and early in the process, um, one of the students in our group, Jia Tan, and I talked about it. 
And we ended up deciding that probably what was happening was that experiment specific features in the data were essentially getting washed out by biological consistency when you looked across enough data sets. But it was always like a, you know, oh, that kind of seems like the right thing, but we didn't have any way to rigorously probe that. And so um, I'm so excited about this work. So um, Alex Lee uh, is a PhD student in the group. Um, and one of the things that Alex has recently been trying to, one of the things that Alex has dug into recently is like, so how does this actually work, right? Like, <laughs> can we actually build a system where we can check the basis of this and get a better understanding of how it would work? Um, and so, you know, there's really these two schools of thought, right? There's this school of thought, um, some of our papers and some papers from other groups as well, where they basically found, you know, hey, if you analyze a whole bunch of data together, you actually do start to find biological features. But then, you know, there's the literature that we're all very familiar with and that I sort of grew up with <laughs> uh, in, in the field where we sort of say, okay, any technical artifacts are going to absolutely destroy the signal. So like, how does this actually work when it shouldn't? Um, so what Alex did, and this was really fun, um, is she trained uh, a certain type of neural network. It's a variational autoencoder on gene expression data. And so what this does, we take a bunch of gene expression data, she trains a neural network to produce some reduced representation, and then she trains another neural network to give you the original data back. Um, and there's one neat trick, you know, it's like, here's the one neat trick of this problem. Um, this representation, she trains in a certain way so that it follows a Gaussian distribution. So the neural network is trying to make this follow a Gaussian distribution. What that means is now you can resample. Uh, and so you can generate entirely synthetic data. Um, and so, you know, you can generate data that have never been observed before, uh, which is kind of fun, but that are compatible with the distribution and, and sort of covariance structure of what you see in real data. Um, and uh, so this is, so she took all, the, she's done this now for sort of human RNA-seq data, as well as this microbe Pseudomonas originosa, just to show that it's kind of a general property. And she's been able to show that, look, if you simulate data, it sort of generally falls into the same space as real data. Um, there are some complexities here. So it does do, there's a little bit of uh, variance compression or over smoothing, which has been reported with variational autoencoders. Um, but you know, it largely seems to work and the data tend to look reasonably realistic. Um, and once you do that, now you can add noise. So you can take your data, generate an entirely new synthetic data set. So now you know what your original data should have looked like. You can add technical noise to that, give you this new data set which has different pieces of technical noise added. And then you can ask how well you get your original, how similar your original data and your new data are. And you can also add a step here where you then remove technical noise. Um, just to give you an idea of what these data sets look like. Oh, and she's got this really cool technique that she developed uh, that I just love where you can actually, um, if you have a template experiment, you can de generate data that mimic that experiment's uh, design without having to know or annotate anything about that experiment's design. So basically what she does is she takes data, she embeds it into the latent space of this neural network, and then she shifts in the latent space uh, by, to some ran, by some random vector, which lets you move to a different part of biology but retain the experimental design, which is totally wild and amazing that it works. <laughs> um, so one of these is a real data set and one of these is a simulated data set. Um, they look pretty darn similar, uh, similar enough that I was an, uh, an uh, mischievous collaborator and I sent them to one of our collaborators. <laughs> I simply just asked them, you know, hey, uh, we've got this data set. Can anyone guess, guess what's going on here? Um, and it was nice. They were able to kind of write a, a really nice biological story um, around the completely synthetic data set and the completely synthetic experiment, which is um, kind of fun. It at least was a nice, this was the first test we did to see if this made any sense at all. Um, and so then we use that, we can generate new data. And then what we can do is we can, because we're adding technical noise, we can build the perfect method for removing that specific form of technical noise. So that's exactly what we did. And so on the left here, what we're showing, this is essentially similarity. So this is asking how similar your original data are to your final data. And your final data are either final data where you've used the perfect noise removal method or final data where you haven't done anything at all to try to remove noise. Um, there's a bunch going on in this plot. So the dotted line here is what you get if you just completely permute your data. So if you randomize your entire matrix, um, you essentially see, um, you know, this should be no similarity effectively. Um, and so this is this this method is really just a way to assess similarity that takes into account that you can have arbitrary rotations of your data that are functionally equivalent. So um, so that's what the SVCCA means. And then what she's done is she's divided her data into partitions, um, the same total amount of data, but divided from zero to six hundred partitions. 
Uh, and then um, what she's doing, she's showing, okay, so if you do correction, uh, if you use this perfect, perfect technical artifact correction method, you know, you see very small amounts of performance degradation at the beginning, and then, you know, you, your data start to look less and less similar to, to your original data. If you do absolutely nothing at all to try to correct for technical noise, um, you see this initial large drop in signal, right? This is like, oh my gosh, I have two different batches here, and they are very different from each other, and that looks really bad. Um, and we, we tried to make this you could play around with the parameters of the simulation to change sort of how steep this peak is, but we wanted a lot of technical noise. So this is actually um, so much technical noise that it's almost down to what you get if you randomize the matrix. Uh, but then you see this really interesting recovery where because the noise sources here are independent of each other, you know, you're essentially finding a point where at some point there is a crossover between where you're doing correction goes from helping you a lot to actually hurting you. The specific point where this crossover occurs, I couldn't tell you, right? The specific point where this crossover occurs is gonna be um, a factor of sort of the type of technical noise that's in your data set, the type of biological signal that's in your data set, the, the sort of overall sort of different sort of experimental designs that compose that data set. Um, but, you know, I think the key element here is just to know that this crossover point exists. Um, and knowing that this crossover point exists, I think starts to reveal why, you know, the data sets on the left, so the experiments that I, that I mentioned at the beginning, those ones on the left were usually analyzing hundreds of experiments, right? A hundred or more different experiments. The ones on the right were usually looking at like three to 10 partitions of the data. And I think that's really the difference. Somewhere in that range of sort of tens to hundreds, we must be seeing this crossover point. And so the literature is actually compatible with each other, uh, as long as you think about sort of the number of partitions being input. So that was really fun. Um, yeah, so this is this is really the take home. The compendia wide analyses actually work because the underlying signal is consistent while the technical noise seems to be experiment specific. Um, so this just got published last year. There's a, a nice GitHub associated with it that sort of uh, describes Alex's work. Um, I don't, you know, I think this is really free. Um, so Vannevar Bush wrote this letter to FDR laying out an argument for a national investment in science. Um, and, you know, it's very much premised on the idea of exploring the unknown. Uh, so, you know, the pioneer spirit is still vigorous within this nation. Science offers a largely unexplored hinterland for the pioneer who has the tools for her or his task. And, you know, I think fundamentally, um, this is what we get from public data, right? This is this lecture is about the bounty of the commons. Well, what the commons give you is the opportunity to gather very large amounts of data that have been analyzed individually, but have not been analyzed yet in concert. And those really are kind of this unexplored hinterland, right? We know a little bit about pieces, but we really don't have a great handle on how it all fits together yet. Um, and so I really think there's just vast opportunities to start um, downloading and using these data together um, and really to come up with methods that place what we're seeing into the, in these data sets into an established body of scientific knowledge so that we can focus on the things that are kind of at variance with what we think we know. Um, I think that's where a lot of the interesting uh, findings will lie. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, I hope that we can lay out maybe not quite the national case for science, although I hope we continue to do that and continue to do a good job of it, but a similar national case for sort of looking at everyone else's data. Um, and then, you know, once you have this technology, there's just some fun things you can do with it. Um, so this is a very quick vignette. Um, I'm just going to give you the, the like ultra brief preview, but I, I hope this also sparks in your imagination. Um, the idea of, you know, if you could generate entirely synthetic data, what would you do, right? Because there's a lot of thought experiments you could do. Um, so another thing that Alex was interested in, uh, so uh, I guess if we were in a room, I would ask how many of you know this, but um, have you ever done an RNA-seq experiment or other genomic profiling experiment and found something where your, experiment, your experimental results look a lot like something that's reported in a paper from a different field? Right, like you find the same differentially expressed genes that someone else finds, or you find the same differentially expressed pathways that someone else finds. Um, you might think, wow, that's really cool. This is sort of a very serendipitous finding. There's a connection there. Um, but, you know, here's something you should probably know. Uh, there are some genomic results that like you see over and over and over and over again. Uh, and uh, these have been reported. So this is a nice paper from uh, Ronnie Powers and Jim Costello's lab, actually here, here in Colorado. Now that I'm here, I can say this. Uh, here in Colorado. Um, so they, what they looked at is whether or not there were pathways that were observed um, over and over again across dip, you know, nominally different profiling experiments, so basically different perturbations. Um, and what they identified were a set of pathways that they argue you need to correct for, right? What you want is not sort of 
your differentially expressed pathways. You want to know which differentially expressed path express pathways are sort of unique to your to your setting. Um, so they have a GSEA and context method that can correct for this. Uh, this is a paper from Megan Crow and Jesse Gillis's lab at Cold Spring Harbor, um, where they, they make the argument that um, a lot of differential expression results are predictable. You don't even need to do the experiment. You can know what's going to be differentially expressed because of these sort of generic differentially expressed genes. Um, so what, you know, one thing you might immediately ask is, oh my gosh, I didn't know these things existed. Although I, I should have also put in the GASH paper from 2000, which is essentially arguing the same thing, right? There's a generic stress response or a generic response to perturbation. But you know, why don't we actually filter these? Why doesn't everyone filter these? So we can just find the things we care about. Well, it turns out finding these requires you know to you to curate hundreds or thousands of different experiments, um, and the generic genes you find are really uh, only specific. They're generic, but within the context of what you're looking at. So the Powers paper, you know, looked at um, a certain type of, of perturbation experiment in cancer cell lines, um, and so they had to curate that in that context. And you'd have to sort of to port it to another context, you'd have to regenerate that or recurate. Um, and if you were ever going to change your statistical methods, now you have to redo all of the curation and analysis again. So it's inordinately time consuming because the, the front end load is huge in terms of the analyst. Um, well, so what we what Alex developed, um, and this is the ultra short vignette, so I won't get to dive into how she did it, but um, this paper will come very soon and the GitHub is already available if you want to see how she's doing it and use it yourself. Um, so this is the differentially expressed prior. So this is from the Crow et al. paper. This is what they reported um, using uh, microarray data sets, actually. They curated a whole bunch of microarray data sets. Um, this is if you use the synthetic data generation approach. So we generate a whole bunch of random experiments using the synthetic data generation strategy with the variational autoencoder. Um, and this is RNA-seq data. So this was actually trained on recount, too. Um, what you see here is, so these genes are ordered from the least um, generic to the most generic. And you can see there's actually quite a bit of consistency in what you see from both the array-based um, and the RNA-seq-based platforms, especially at the extremes of the distribution. So your most differentially expressed genes might be heavily dominated by these generic genes. It's just worth noting. And I will say um, this takes quite a long time, and you had to curate um, roughly 1,000. I think it was 650 different experiments and analyze them uh, individually to synthesize these results. This, uh, you had to run a cell in an IPython notebook and wait an hour. Um, and so I think efficiency wise, now this is a thing that you can actually practically do um, as opposed to sort of a really nice theoretical thing that you should do. Uh, so the benefits of using simulation used with this technology, you can use unlabeled gene expression data. So the only data that you actually have to characterize are the ones that for the experiment that you care about. For everything else, you can use, uh, you can use unlabeled data to build the model. Um, you can use it for any platform, organism or more. So we've now done this in Pseudomonas originosa. So we, I think, <laughs> characterized, you know, generic, uh, generic findings outside of human, and they they exist there too, which is worth noting. Um, and you can plug it in with any analytical strategy or experimental design because you're simulating the data, them, the data themselves. All you have to be able to do is simulate data that look like your original data, and then you run them through exactly the same process. So it's kind of arbitrary what that analytical strategy is. Um, so this paper is being written, but. Um, like some things in the lab, uh, it's available on GitHub as it's as it's happening. So if you want to see this project and where it's going, I think this will probably be up on a preprint server pretty soon. The paper's in really good shape. Um, we just had um, there's some really nice biological validation for some of these sort of specific findings that's just gotten done um, that's being worked into the paper before we submit it. Um, but anyway, the methods are here if you want to try to start correcting for your own uh, generic differentially generic differentially expressed genes in your own experiments. Um, and then finally, uh, Brian alluded to this a little bit in the intro. Um, I didn't want this whole talk to be genomics. I wanted to talk about some things that were, I think, maybe more important than uh, the genomics research that we do. Um, so this is work from Treng Le, who was, who was actually a postdoc in a different lab at Penn, but who um, was really excited about this project and took it on and ended up leading, uh, leading this work. So what we were really interested in was understanding how equitably we distribute scientific honors. Um, you know, and I think, you know, sometimes we could think about, you know, scientific honors, like why do we care about scientific honors, right? Like what does it matter who gets an award, right? The words are essentially the least valuable thing we could consider, right? Like what matters more is papers, what matters more is funding. Um, but, you know, I think that in some ways makes scientific honors a good thing to look at, right? Because, you know, we can, I think they're a nice place to examine our biases and blind spots and try to identify where we have um, problems that we're not, you know, fully addressing. Um, so we used ISCB as a case study. You could have probably pointed the same method at any at any society, professional society that you're part of. 
Um, and, and actually you can now if you take the GitHub and, and do that. Um, but we used ISCB because it's the sort of society that as a computational biologist, I feel kind of most tightly associated with. Um, it's supposed to be a worldwide society. So that's the key bit here. Um, so it's supposed to serve a global membership. And so we wanted to ask, you know, how representative are honors in ISCB of the global computational biology and bioinformatics research community? Um, yeah, so, so, you know, this is why I think analyzing things in the context of honors is safe, uh, is a good way to go, because um, peer review is like just ultimately central to science. Um, and I think, you know, if you look across a large body of work and there are issues, it, it's always easy to have a quibble with a specific example. But if you look across a really large body of work and we're sort of seeing differences in just who we choose to honor, I think that can really point to um, our, our own weaknesses. Um, and, you know, there's some papers uh, that have looked at, um, you know, success rates for funding from minority scientists um, and found that, you know, in this case, this was a paper from um, NIH that looked at um, success rates. And it, it makes the argument that um, minority scientists were applying for awards on topics with lower success rates. Um, you know, I think that um, there's two possible things here because science is so peer driven. Um, you know, success rates are not extraneous to the, the actual evaluation process, right? So if, if majority group scientists were less likely to recognize the importance of the work, you know, that, that drives success rates. And so I think thinking about direct, if we directly measure peer recognition, we can help to maybe disentangle these factors. And if we see biases, um, you know, that can suggest that um, they're not necessarily in the success rates so much as our, our own um, preconceived notions about what's important. Uh, so we curated roughly 400 honorees. Um, we did this for by looking at keynote speakers at the major international meetings. So these are the, the kind of major ISCB associated meetings. One is ISMB, the other is RECOM. They've been going. Um, we did this up to 2019, actually. Um, and then we also looked at ISCB fellows, which is essentially the, the major honor bestowed by the society and members who have distinguished themselves. Um, now, one thing you might ask is, you know, well, what, what's the distribution of the field, which turns out to be hard to estimate. Um, you know, you might imagine going through 400-ish honor, honorees and trying to curate, uh, but you can't sort of curate all of computational biology. And so we downloaded all papers that had computational biology mesh headings, which is about 150,000 papers. And then we built an automated processing system that extracted author name, the author position, affiliations, and then we had software we wrote to map affiliations to countries. Um, we estimated gender from first name. We used genderize.io. We queried with a first name and got a probability back. Um, so if we query Casey, we get 74% male. Um, we then used the sort of quantitative values here. So we recognize that on individual cases, these are likely to make uh, errors. Um, but we, you know, our hope was that as we looked across hundreds and as we sort of, we didn't binarize gender. So we left the uncertainty that came back um, in our analysis. So every one of my papers would get added um, with, you know, 74% to the male column and 26% to the female column. And this gave us gender predictions for 409 of the honorees and about 150,000 senior authors in computational biology. Um, and then uh, we can then use this as a background so we can look at PubMed. Um, I will say um, of most journals in the field didn't really contribute um, first names uh, to PubMed until around this point. So behind, before this, there's very few papers in this sample size just because most journals were first initial only. Um, but you know, once you get to the sample size, it gets, once you get past um, this year, it gets quite robust. And you can see there's been a slow increase in the, the proportion of authors who are predicted to be the, the predicted female contribution. Um, you, know, you can see there was um, not quite the same corresponding increase in the early years of sort of ISCB um, honors, but um, things are, appear to have gotten somewhat better in, in recent times as we look at gender. Um, you know, it's worth noting that the women of the proportion of women as last authors is lower than the proportion of receiving grants. So there's a paper on bioarchive that um, noticed this. So um, it's entirely possible that women and likely that women are not getting credit in accordance with their work. Um, and so, you know, this would actually paradoxically make ISCB look like it's doing better. So this should be kind of a lower bound on performance. Um, and the other thing to note is that this is really just measuring diversity, not equity. So systemic factors that reduce the fraction of women that are senior authors would actually make the honoree pool look more representative. So, so um, you know, I think that's, uh, that's an important thing to recognize is that I think we should strive for, for parity um, and um, not 
you know, just sort of not being less systemically biased than society as a whole. That seems like not the right thing for a society to focus on. Um, the next thing we wanted to know is what, if there was um, if there were other uh, author related factors that that you know were associated with um, honoree uh, with being honored. So we scraped English language Wikipedia for living persons. So we thought uh, nationality or name origin uh, might be a key one. Um, so we extracted what was termed by Wikipedia as nationality. Uh, we grouped categories using this data driven approach, um, and then we trained a neural network to predict the group from three grams of the name. Um, and this actually works pretty darn well. Um, in many cases, it, it's quite accurate. Um, and the classifier predictions seem to be pretty well calibrated. So in these, just like in the genderized.io case, uh, we use the continuous value um, and we add them together. Um, in the interest of time, I won't dive into um, characterizing classifier. So here's where we see really big disparities. Um, so if we look at PubMed authors on the left, um, you can see um, there's a real uh, strong overabundance of Celtic, English, and European names. And now we've actually broken this out even further. If you want to see the most recent version of the paper, I'll put the URL up at the end. Um, and we've broken this down into even smaller geographic groups. Um, but you can see there's a really a large increase in the number of um, the name probability associated with um, East Asian names in the author pool, but we really don't see a corresponding increase in the keynote speakers and fellows pool. Um, and so that was, um, you know, I think this represents a blind spot of the organization. I don't think the organization is effectively recognizing contributions from a, a group of scientists. Um, you know, we could just say, well, this is probably just geography, right? ISCB was founded in between the US and Europe. Maybe it's just representing the US and Europe. So we can ask um, if there are countries that have many more honorees than you would expect based on the um, based on PubMed. So this is looking at the fraction of honorees versus PubMed. Um, the expected is the dots, the observed are the triangles. And you can see there's a, it, it depends on how you sort of slice things, but in this case, 154 more honorees from the US than you would expect um, based on the, the sort of fraction of the liter peer reviewed literature that is coming from the US in the field, um, and 70 fewer than you expect from China. Um, and you can see similarly, there are a couple notable increases, but by and large, um, there's kind of depletion, particularly um, outside of the US and Europe. Um, and so then you could say, well, you know, there, there are some countries where there's enough honorees that you could estimate, um, you could look just within those countries. So we look just within the US. Um, and we actually, I should say, because of the way we did this, we didn't use US names. US names were not assigned to any category as we were training the classifier um, because, you know, um, we, we were going to sort of do this at the end and we didn't want any circularity there that would increase the proportion of US names associated with one group. Um, and you, but you see the same thing here, right? You see a depletion of the, the authors with East Asian name origin. And so, you know, I think uh, this points to a real problem the society has had. Um, and I hope they, they, for at least last year, seem to be making a little bit of progress in addressing it with the folks who were honored last year. Um, this year, the full set of honorees is not available, but hopefully they'll continue to make progress. Um, you know, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, what we can measure is diversity. Um, in this case, we really can't measure equity. Um, and so, you know, I think as we think about equity, you know, we should probably view a lot of these numbers um, as, you know, uh, uh, not the end goal, but sort of a measure of progress. Um, and so, you know, I think ISCB should do at least as well as sort of the author contribution of the field in terms of recognizing contributions. What we'd like to see is, is ISCB really um, put a particular emphasis on um, recognizing uh, people who have overcome barriers. And I think, you know, we like to think that we're not biased. So like, actually, when I started talking about this with, um, with folks in the society, you know, one of the things I got as well, you know, we can't judge, you know, we, we can't judge ourselves based on, you know, distribution maybe in the field, because what we really want to judge are sort of the importance of contributions. But like at the end of the day, the importance of contributions come down to sort of what you've done in the peer reviewed literature. And, you know, we've done this analysis a ton of different ways. We've done this analysis, you know, where you wait by number of times a paper is cited. It doesn't matter how you slice the data. There are problems here. Uh, like we have not been able to slice the data in some way that do not show problems. Um, and it's, it's a consistent underrepresentation of, of honorees with East Asian name origin by ISCB. So, um, you know, I think we like to think that we're sort of, science itself is, uh, is self-governing. And if we sort of blind ourselves to our biases and we don't wanna look at them, 
um, then we're going to end up in a place we don't really want to be. So I hope that um, people start to take their, their own professional societies to task over this type of uh, behavior. Um, so this is available if you want to read the paper. Um, it's on GitHub. Um, we tried to submit it to ISCB's uh, prime, prime, pay, prime conference last year, uh, ISMB, uh, and um, we did receive a record number of reviewers, more reviewers than I've ever seen on an ISCB paper, but it was ultimately not accepted. Um, but if you're interested in reading the paper, it is on GitHub and it's available. Um, and then I just wanted to have a quick plug for this service. Um, I'll come right back to this slide at the end so people can play around with it. We built a thing. So if you have a preprint, you can plug in a DOI for that preprint and see what other papers, published papers are similar to it and where it kind of falls in a bioarchive landscape. But I'll come back to this at the end so people can see the uh, URL. Um, and this paper uh, is also be online while it's being written. Uh, it should be up really soon on bioarchive as well. Um, with that, you know, I just want to thank the people who make this possible before I take a little bit of time to answer some questions. Um, Alex Lee um, did a lot of the work that I presented on the um, data simulation approach. Um, Trang Le led the diversity analyses. Um, Jacqueline Taroni, who's now um, at the Childhood Cancer Data Lab for Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, did the sort of first multiplier analysis. Uh, Brian did a wonderful job of listing funders, so I won't I won't, uh, I won't belabor the point here. If you want to find out more, we have a lab website uh, at greenlab.com and you can see um, the, the rest of the stuff that we've been working on. And I'll just leave up this page while I answer questions so that people can play around with this URL if you want to. Fantastic, thank you, Casey. That was really, uh, really cool and a lot of food for thought there. Um, I, I see that there's already one question and while, People are getting ready to uh, ask other questions. I hope I, I also have a question or two as well. Let, let's start with the question that Zachary Eichenberger asked, which was, how do you ensure that the initial encoding is in a Gaussian distribution when you're generating data? Uh, um, yeah, so the way that neural network is trained, um, the, so the initial form of it may not be. So you're basically the, the encoder step, um, the encoder has to learn how to map your input to a low dimensional space um, that follows a desired distribution. So that's optimized for the KL divergence. Um, and that also allows you to um, reconstruct the input data. So there's, there's, there's actually two um, parts of the loss function for this neural network. So one is the reconstruction loss and the other one is this sort of KL divergence loss. So the input doesn't necessarily have to be, but it has to be mappable to this, this space. I hope. I think that was the question. Good. I, I don't quite see the questions. Maybe they're, maybe I'm missing. It, that one happened to be in the chat. Um, okay. Oh, here we go. So, uh, you know, we'll see if, if other questions come in through the chat or if there's any follow up to that one. Uh, well, I was one from Dana King in a QA section too. I don't oh, know. Okay. It seems to be separate from the chat. Um, oh, very interesting. Yes, you're right. I don't, can, okay. I, can people see this? I can see it. All right. Okay. So Dana King is asking, um, in, in case others can't see it, I'll go ahead and read this. So thank you for uh, uh, particularly for shedding light on the unknown unknowns, including on diversity and equity in the field. For the multiplier and compendia parts of the talk, is there a lower limit for sample numbers or related data sets that's worth applying these methods to or a rule of thumb for guiding these decisions when applying these methods? Um, uh, I, I don't think, I don't think we can know the answer to that question. So I've thought about this a lot. Um, and I have never been clever enough to come up with a way to answer that question, because I think what you would need to do, I, I can't come up with a way to do it that doesn't involve running a whole bunch of assays, um, at a whole bunch of different places, um, to generate sort of different technical artifacts. Like you'd almost have to like randomly take the experiments that have been done and subsample them in some way uh, based on their experimental design. And then you'd have to like contract labs to run, um, you'd have to somehow contract labs to like actually run those experiments that you'd sort of randomly assign to them. But sometimes you'd assign two, you know, similar experiments to two labs. Um, and you'd really want to measure like what the lab specific effect is. I know the labs like lab specific effects have been measured in a very localized context a few times by some kind of large um, efforts to analyze kind of RNA seq consistency across groups, um, but it's so localized in biology that it, I, I'm not sure how representative it is. So uh, I don't have a great answer for that. I guess I would say um, 
we've had a lot of good luck when we've gone beyond hundreds of experiments. So hundreds of separate experiments. Each one might be quite small. You know, might have six to, to 10 samples in it. Um, but that's where we've had a lot of luck. But, uh, and it, you know, if I think about the papers that exist in the field, um, they usually vary from sort of hundreds to thousands of experiments where people are sort of seeing success. So I guess I would have to say rule of thumb more than 100 seems like a reasonable rule of thumb, but um, that's a really rough guess. I don't know how to answer it in a more principled way. All right. Well, one thing that I'm, I was wondering about as you were presenting is it's, your talk really got me thinking about the modularity of biology and also got me thinking about all of the data sets that exist at the, in, the, in the mouse. And I'm curious, have you, uh, would, would we find that the modules that are, re represent generic stress responses are the same in mice and in humans? Are, are, are there other, um, if we were to try to understand how the modules change in response to certain experiments or in disease states in humans, would we be able to find it? interesting differences compared with mice using the methods that you're uh, using. I'm trying to figure out whether we can get new insight into comparisons between humans and mice uh, using these methods. Yeah, so I have some guesses, um, but I have no hard and fast answers. So uh, in the world of guesses, what I would say is um, humans are a little bit weird in the public data um, in that, um, you know, human tissue is not the easiest thing to get, uh, except in the case of malignancy. Um, and so, um, and, and, and cell lines, which, you know, are off, you know, often look a fair bit like malignancy. And, you know, the first ones are essentially um, cancers that have been uh, further transformed. Um, so I would say, I think human, I think it's going to be hard to get a strong estimate of normal human biology, generic, generically expressed genes in normal human biology, I think the, um, that would require a lot of curation. Um, on the other hand, I think in mice, it's gonna be a lot easier um, in mice and other model systems. Um, and I suspect, you know, we, we've done this in human data and we've done this in um, pseudomonas data. Those are the two cases we've really looked at in detail um, thus far. And, you know, I also think the type of signals that you see in those are gonna be different. Uh, like in humans, if you look at complex human tissues, right, you've got a whole bunch of sort of line linear composition plays a huge role, right, because it's essentially cell type fraction of like a biopsy or, or the tissue that you took. Um, and that's less true in something like pseudomonas. So I think there's going to be like different architectures of where these generic genes fall in biological networks. Um, when you look at human versus metazoans versus single celled organisms. Um, and I think the human one is gonna be an artifact of the fact that most of the samples, the, a huge fraction of our data is sort of not quite the same, but I, yeah. So I think if you withheld human from the process, you might get some really nice insights into sort of what generic perturbations look like in certain types of, of organisms, but we haven't done that work yet. I see, okay, great. Well, it seems like, uh, you know, thinking about that, uh, quote from Bush, I think these tools really do open up vistas on all kinds of interesting questions. I don't, I don't know what we're going to find using these tools, but I think we're going to find a lot of interesting things. No, no question about it. So um, I don't, I, I, I have other questions, but I don't want to uh, uh, drive the conversation uh, solely in the direction that I'm interested in. So I think at this point, maybe uh, unless there are further questions from the audience, maybe we could go ahead and let you get ready for subsequent talk uh, or, or uh, conversations that I think you're going to have uh, after your talk. And uh, I want to thank you again for a great talk and uh, for visiting us, e-visiting e us. Thank you for e-having me. <laughs>